Welcome to the Sustainable Development E-Talk series, co-hosted by CNS and Indian Institute of Management, Indore. Our guest speakers for today are Professor Dr. Rishi Sethi and Amit Khare. Dr. Rishi is a noted cardiologist and biomedical innovation researcher. He is professor in the Department of Cardiology at King George's Medical University. Amit Khare is co-founder and CEO Evolco Systems, which is a California-based medical technology company that provides artificial intelligence and machine learning-based solutions to hospitals. Amit has earlier worked for over 20 years with Oracle, managing global software teams in various countries. Uh, our speakers will share their insights on how artificial intelligence and machine learning based solutions can address the challenges in healthcare, including those in India. A very warm welcome from the Indian Institute of Management to today's esteemed speakers for the SDG e talk. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, very good evening from here in India. I think it's, it's early morning for Amit. So, uh, uh, greetings for whatever time of the day we are meeting. Uh, thank you, Shobaji. It's always Really a great pleasure to be on the same platform as the Citizens News Service. And today actually is a little more, you know, happy occasion for me because I have to set the table uh, for a very close friend, Amit Kare, who um, would be speaking to us about the use of technologies in healthcare, um, especially in times of pandemic and how, how uh, things like artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning would help us cope with these, uh, these pandemics. Um, you know, I had, it's really Amit's presentation and I was setting the tone for, you know, Amit's talk. Mm -hmm. And in that scenario, you know, I briefly wanted to talk to all of you about how in times of pandemic, you know, we can have, we can have newer healthcare technologies that can help us uh, ward off these crises uh, in these difficult times. What has happened over a course of, you know, last many, many years and throughout generations, probably that man has forgotten his, you know, um, kind of uh, uh, his stature in, in, in front of the universe and in front of mother earth. And man is nothing but a very tiny spicule in, in terms of, um, vastness of this universe and we have time and again taught ourselves to be all powerful and we have um, you know made, made made the mistake of trying to challenge mother earth and thereby we have been we had been forced into situations uh, where we really find hard to escape from so one can never adequately be prepared for any pandemic because if we are adequately prepared and if we have all the solutions then pandemics will not happen there would always be a microorganisms that would crop up unexpectedly anywhere on the globe, which either is a new microorganism um, that has, you know, transferred itself from animals to humans. There would be, you know, maybe an existing microorganism, which we at, at this point of time, maybe thought it was insignificant. There can be a mutant form. So these microorganisms would keep on cropping up anywhere across the globe from the meat markets of Wuhan to the deep jungles of Africa, to maybe a ranch in Texas. And when these microorganisms catch us by surprise, then probably we will not have the diagnostic efficacy to diagnose them early on. We will not have therapeutic options in terms of medicines and vaccines. And our protocols to limit the spread would be actually naive in front of the contagious natures of these microorganisms. So um, I, I really want to quote um, you know, one of uh, Martin Luther King's uh, phrase that out of a mountain of despair, there's always a ray of hope. So it's true that situations like COVID-19, uh, like any other pandemic, um, are a mountain of despair for humanity. But it is also true that compared to any other pandemic that has happened uh, before in history, we are actually a little better prepared in order to deal with this crisis because um, we have better telecommunication skills now, which have helped us in, uh, in sharing the data about the spread of the disease and led to its containment. 
uh, we have you have better techniques to develop um, vaccines and drugs and they are actually still not there but they are in the in the rapidly being manufactured uh, category so we might have a vaccine or might have a new drug very soon so we we technology wise are better prepared we have better technologies that hospitals can use to limit the interface between the patient and the doctor and thereby limiting the contagious nature of the disease so we are we are actually a little better placed and uh, and that's a, a reason why we are having this talk today we'd like to know uh, from amit what are the different technologies using artificial intelligence and and machine learning which he is an expert of um, and how these technologies can be used during these desperate times uh, quick fast innovative technologies uh, so as to help us help us uh, better fight this menace uh, of pandemic the technologies per se that we can use can be divided into two categories one is those technologies that uh, help us fight against the pathogen per se these are newer diagnostic methodologies the newer drugs newer vaccines um, and probably these are little more biotechnology kind of subjects and these are not the point of our discussion today but uh, we would be focusing our attention today on those technologies which decrease the human interface during screening and treating of patients and also provide better efficacy of screening technology um, which help us get more and more of these patients screen more and more uh, of these patients at the same time limiting the human interface which uh, which would have uh, led to a situation of a more rapid spread uh, of the disease given its contagious nature it can be a simple uh, triaging system or a robotic system at the gate of the hospital that that without human interface uh, sees a patient scans his body temperature takes his basic symptoms and alerts the authorities about uh, about uh, the possibility of this patient's uh, being a covid or a contagious um, patient and, uh, and and alert the authorities and thereby if the patient has symptoms um, of COVID um, or, or is by any screening methodology, then limit his entry into the common area of the hospital. We can also have technologies while treating the patients during procedures as we in cardiology like angioplasty or any other surgery. We can have robotic surgeries where the operator and the team actually sits outside the OT and perform the procedure with the help of console, um, thereby again limiting the entire team being exposed to the patient on the table. And we can have uh, uh, other technologies, smart technologies, um, about which Amit probably would be speaking here, which uses more advanced form of um, human um, uh, endeavors in terms of computing, in terms of uh, deep neural networks, artificial intelligence, and machine-based learning. So I think uh, so much from uh, technology novice um, like me and uh, moving over to Amit, uh, a brief introduction. Of course, he is the CEO of Evolco Systems and he's an old hand in the, tech in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning. But on a more human aspect, uh, me and Amit uh, have been interacting with each, with each other for almost more than past 10, 12 years now on various forms of um, hospital information based systems we started initially with hospital information systems then we worked, went on to uh, the apps which help us uh, connect with the patient from remotely and now um, it's the robotic triage that we have in our outpatients i hope my slides were working i had some very interesting photographs to show you but uh, life is not fair and the sooner we learn the that the better it is more so in times of pandemic so um handing over to my good old friend amit who would be doing the rest of the talk and maybe um we can together take questions um, towards the end amit please thank you dr rishi thank you so much and uh, thank you shobhaji uh, and the folks in uh, i am indoor it's a pleasure to talk to you, uh, you all of them, um, such a wonderful audience. Uh, I would like to uh, keep the um, conversation uh, more interactive if, if possible. And uh, 
Rishi and I uh, go, as he mentioned, like long way, uh, we have been interacting and discussing uh, so many uh, things uh, about like improving the life in healthcare. Uh, this is one of the, uh, one of the key areas uh, where our interest uh, used to, uh, stop sharing. just let me share the, Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. So, uh, during my tenure at Oracle, I had to go uh, and visit my team in India very often. And uh, being a Lucknowite, I used to go to Lucknow and meet uh, Rishi and, and my other friends at uh, King George Medical University. Uh, and, and I believe me or not, they are like super busy doctors. Uh, They're not just the specialists, they are really, really busy. And, and I had to wait like an hour or more than that for them to free up from their uh, overwhelming crowd of uh, uh, patients before we could go out to have, a, um, have some snacks or coffee. Uh, but during that time, I used to interact with the with the patients uh, in their waiting area and try to see like what's actually going on and how how we can help um, going forward. Uh, so that is that is the premise like how we we started interacting and and finding trying to find out uh, the solution to the problems uh, and and we we identified like okay how how we could solve some of the uh, problems but the main thing that uh, the current uh, keeping the current scenario in in focus uh, which is the coronavirus pandemic that is going on um, and and i had like some discussions over here in stanford uh, with some of the folks here also and everybody agreed that yes a lot of focus is being given to uh, uh, to infected patients and to uh, to avoid infection and avoid uh, uh, spread of infection and all those things. But if you look at it, the main problem that people are facing are the regular patients, the patients who already uh, were sick, having um, uh, having to visit their doctors more often and discuss things. They are not able to do that because of the lockdown, because of the fear of getting infection, if they even go up there and all those things. So um, it, is, it is generally accepted uh, by many, many doctors and many, uh, many so uh, uh, social workers and, and all the organizations that yes, um, long-term care patients are, are one of the um, few categories where people are are deeply affected with coronavirus and and some solution is definitely needed immediately for them to uh, to get back to to their normal normal routine uh, during our our, our discussions uh, with with rishi and with with other doctors we recognized three problems uh, back there in, in a couple of uh, years or maybe more um, and, and recently these problems were uh, endorsed by Niti Aayog. Their report came out in December, 2019. Um, and the main problem that people are associating with healthcare is that the most of the treatment is episodic. And because of the episodic treatment, um, uh, there is no focus on identifying uh, the non-communicable diseases which actually becoming the leading cause of death. Uh, it was like a zero out of five in 1990 to top three, uh, uh, three, three out of five in 2016. So, so these non-communicable diseases, which are diabetes, hypertension and all those, and these are the cancer and, and other diseases. So these are the one which, which hogs up uh, most of the health system resources. 
and if they are not treated uh, and if they are not screened early enough there is a heavy uh, load on the system uh, in addition to that once it is diagnosed it requires a very regular monitoring and all those things and if that is not done then there are preventable complications uh, which end up like uh, taking the life and uh, in extreme cases and uh, and disability those type of uh, uh, after uh, those type of problems that we face in in the system but if you look at it from from the point of view of india uh, the ratio of doctor to patient is very obscure uh, we have about like 1700 uh, patients per doctor or 1700 uh, population for one doctor uh, compared to one to um, one is to 900 which is recommended uh, by who and in case of rural india it is it is even worse uh, so there is a shortage and the problem that we are seeing is that the patients are increasing at about like a 12% doctors are increasing about like 5 to 6% which is <laughs> hello so uh, and that is actually causing um, more problem because doctors are not going to um, we are not going to get the doctors fixed in in couple of decades uh, especially as doctors are really rare and all these like long term diseases uh, require the specialist help and and we believe only technology can can help uh, so our focus is uh, there are about like a 1 billion long term patients in in the entire world right now and uh, and that's increasing uh, which is a which is a worry what we thought like how to fix the problem um, is if we can provide the decision making information to the doctor uh, before the consultation um, whether it is a new consult or follow up so doctors can make a better use of their time uh, one of the key things that technology has done these days and and you all would would agree if we today we we have to meet like about 100 people uh, it will be it will be next to impossible and uh, but we can reply to all 100 people using whatsapp or email which are the asynchronous uh, means of communication and that we uh, we can deal with those uh, uh, 100 messages within within an hour or so so that's that's the advantage of asynchronously working uh, it reduces a lot of uh, overhead and that's something that we want to use in uh, in in the clinical field as well and that's that's exactly what what we wanted to do we thought if we could do that we will save doctors time and that's the precious time uh, they are there are very few specialist doctors in the world uh, and doctor like rishi sethi and all are like uh, you can count them on on one hand finger so so that's that's very rare thing and everybody wants to meet them and everybody wants to get their time uh, so we we have to save their time the benefit that we want through the asynchronous technology to help this way uh, similarly uh, if we are if they we get their time uh, it is very important uh uh because for the patient that time means like they will get better results uh their complications will reduce and and they will they will uh they will have a much better uh life um, quality of life uh, if they are in in best hands and that's that increases their satisfaction and all those things and asynchronous means when you are not synchronously meeting the doctor that you are having fewer trips that means you are reducing the exposure to infection uh, that's that's very important in the in the current scenario uh, where the patients who are already having having problem they should not incur and get newer problems so that's uh, uh, so i'll i'll go by one 
one example i'll say like okay how we can uh, asynchronously screen the patients so at at evolco we developed the technology uh, which we call the robotic triage uh, a robotic system uh, using uh, mobile devices to screen the patient so we will take the information from the patient and try to find out what is actually going on and prepare a good profile for the doctor to take a uh, take a final uh, look at it and and decide what the treatment plan should be so it intelligently knows like okay what what the issues patients are going on once the patient starts uh, and that's exactly what happens when you go and meet a doctor he will ask like very intelligent questions uh, within like seven or eight questions he will figure it out what's going on uh, with some diagnostic and all he will just like confirm that uh, the problem and start the treatment plan and so interaction with the patient is a is a longer process and if that is taken care of by uh, of uh, taken care of by some uh, software that will that will help uh, the doctor a lot in their um, saving their time so we will take a case of chest pain i'll just like uh, show you how software uh, triages the patient uh, if we take like say chest pain a patient comes with the chest pain um, and and then software would say okay are you having a chest pain with exertion or without exertion trying to find out more relevant details uh, so these these questions decide like uh, which way the the treat of the diagnosis and the treatment will go so they try to try to find out cardiac symptoms there are other cardiac symptoms other than chest pain uh, then they would like to know whether it is radiating or something and the person said yeah it is small left shoulder which is uh, which is very common uh, in chest pain people do refer to that okay on the left side if they are having chest pain definitely got be got to be uh, heart related and all uh but but software tries to find out whether it is related to the shoulder or it related to the chest pain it could uh, immediately say you raise your hand and uh, that means it's ruling out the problems with the with the shoulder if the person can raise its hand uh good if it is not uh, if the patient cannot then it will try to find out whether because of the pain because of the stiffness or because of the weakness and they all will have a different connotation different meaning for the doctor these are all very relevant question and uh, that they generally go through so uh, once once we figure it out okay the patient is this is because of the shoulder and all software continues and try to find out more details from the patient to see whether it's like uh, uh, other non communicable disease that can be screened uh during the interaction with the patient and that's very precious instruction uh, as much information should be uh, discovered uh during this um, so that the software get intelligently refer to the to the doctor so so once that happens uh i'm just giving an overview of the of the technology how the technology works uh we take the information from the patient uh their symptoms their uh, the detailed triaging that that i have just shown um uh, which is a q and a between the software and the and the patient uh, get some more details and send it to the doctor after analyzing the information a report is prepared sent to the doctor and doctor does the <laughs> treatment uh, planning and and which saves the time for for the doctor uh, that's uh, that's that's what our uh, premise is is from the technology uh the solution that that we are providing and and the technology can provide uh, uh in in coming days so uh, pre screen the patient whether it is uh, through the software or a uh, a uh, not so uh, uh, not by the trained doctor by a, by a uns unskilled person um just to make the interaction so we screen the patient before the consultation during the consultation we do provide some solution uh that 
uh, Dr. Rishi was talking about that we started a long time back. And post consultation, when the consultation is done, uh, the patient should still be interacting with the software and is still providing more details what's going on during the during the follow up, and that gives a very detailed information for the uh, for the clinicians to find out whether they are, what the efficacy of the treatment plan that they put together, whether it requires any changes, and, and they can intervene ahead of time and provide that uh, those details very quickly uh, to the patient and, and save a lot of time uh, for both of them. Uh, this is not just asynchronous. I mean, uh, we thought that this technology only worked asynchronously, uh, but some of the places people have deployed the synchronous solution uh, as well, uh, using uh, using the operators which are not doctors. Uh, so they are, in fact, whether it is synchronous, they are saving time for the doctor in, in both the cases. What we saw uh, at the, uh, using our technology, uh, which is, which is intelligently taking the information from the patient and, and providing more detailed output to the doctor to take, take care uh, of the patient. About 94% improvement in the quality of care. Uh, that's, that's a huge number, mind boggling number. Uh, it's not easy to achieve uh, uh, without, without the use of some, some good technology and all. Uh, patients were very happy uh, in the interaction because there was a study in Harvard which shows that 69 to 70% patients do not remember what their doctors tell them during the consultation. Uh, and that's that's a huge number and that was done in, in New York. Uh, and, and we are talking about the city patients. So, uh, so patients felt that, okay, their information, they are uh, being heard more in more detail and uh, and they were very comfortable uh, in providing all the details which helped them into the better diagnosis and better uh, treatment planning in a faster way. Uh, doctors did save a lot of time, 30% is a huge time uh, in a day if you, uh, uh, if you take a look, detailed look at it. And uh, because all the interactions happen remotely and asynchronously, there's definitely a reduction uh, in the crowd in waiting room. Less crowd in waiting room means less chances of infection. Um, this is the study that Dr. Uh, Rishi did in KGMU, um, uh, the BP control uh, in, in, uh, in post-angioplasty, uh, and I'm sure he will talk about it um, after a couple of course slides that I need to just go through. Uh, we served about 8 million patients so far using this technology and, and we hope that uh, similar technologies will evolve and, uh, and, and a lot of patients will go through, should go through this. Uh, uh, with that, I will uh, just hand over the uh, bike to Dr. Rishi to talk about the study that he has, he has done or it was done under, under his guidance. Uh, Dr. Rishi. Uh, that the ACS BP control. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we have uh, we have actually been um, working with. Uh, I think we can. We have actually been working with um, uh, Evolco Systems and Amit for quite some time now, and. Uh, these studies are specifically that we are talking about here have been done in association with cardiology, where we have tried to see that um, if we remotely uh, get, uh, I mean, a standard outpatients that we get every day is around is around 400 to 600 patients. And it is not, uh, and the next time he comes back to us after one month to three months to six months, the patient remains uh, grossly disconnected with us. So uh, while using this um, application of health radar, we try to remain in touch with uh, a select group of patients and uh, throughout the period of between their two visits and we compare them to the standard uh, process 
of routine management of remaining disconnected with these patients. And we found that when we remained connected uh, asynchronously, as Amit was saying with these patients, uh, even when they were not visiting us um, physically, then it lead, led to a lot of improvement in their, in their satisfaction index uh, because um, they felt that despite, they were, despite the fact that they were away from the hospital, their doctor was, was kind of sensitive to their needs and was listening to them, uh, even if, if, even if it's, it was on, um, on something like an online chat. And uh, at the same point of time, <coughs> things which can be monitored uh, distally, like blood pressure, when these patients were more sensitive to their health care, they were taking their blood pressures and they were reporting back their blood pressures and any change in the medication was being prescribed, then uh, they certainly had much better control of their pressure. So, I mean, it was a short-term study, so we just could study the blood pressure part of it. But given the long-term impact, if you do a long-term study, I'm sure that many other aspects of, uh, of management uh, would, would improve uh, if we are remotely connected to our patients. But that was a cardiology study. I think we, we can open up the questions because uh, general speaking, generally speaking, for if, if anybody has any questions about uh, uh, the pandemics and the use of artificial intelligence and machine-based learnings and other technologies in healthcare, then probably they can come forward and, and preferably Amit or, or I can also add a little bit to it. So Shobhaji, can we open up the question and answer? Yes, yes, yes. Many thanks, Amit and Rishi, for a very informative and very interesting talk. I have learned so many new things from this today. And we now open for the question and answer session. And participants, please raise your virtual hand to ask your question or type in your question in the chat box and get uh, many doubts, any doubts which you have clarified. Uh, I don't have doubts, but... Uh, uh, Amit said, uh, and you, uh, it is said generally that this will this saves the doctor's time and rightly so. But I think it saves the patient's time also. And uh, as has been pointed out by both of you, because there's a lot of uh, hospital-based infections which we acquire while waiting in the OPD and in the waiting area. So I think it, uh, not only, and doctor's time of course is precious, but even for the patients, I think it is, it's a win-win situation. Uh, so I want to know uh, how much is this technology being used in uh, India, Rishi? Or are you promoting it or any hospitals using the technology in India? Uh, so I, I'll, I'll take the part of the use of this technology. So as we are speaking, we have... Um, so there are two aspects to this technology, um, if I may clarify... Uh, Amit had spoken about them. One is a health radar, which is an application on your mobile phone where you remain connected to the patient. Um, and the other is the robotic triage that when the patient comes to the outpatient department, then he has sort of a airport kiosk where he just, without before he comes to the doctor, he punches in, he types in on a touch screen, his, his name, his, his number. So his all the past records are retrieved back and he just enters his fresh symptoms, and then um, he gets sort of an outpatient's boarding pass. So both these applications are actually in use. And uh, uh, although um, health radar more so on a trial basis in our department, but in other hospitals, Amit will tell you that it's being used routinely. But the robotic triad system in the outpatients has been now um, in our outpatient department of um, of orthopedics and cardiology and a few other departments um, that Amit will uh, brief you about. And we are routinely using the robotic triage in our OPD for more than um, one and a half years now. So it's an, it's an active use. It's not just a revolutionary technology. We are actively using it in our patients also. Mm -hmm. That's in the cardiology department. <laughs> we, are, we are using cardiology, orthopedics, and Amit, uh, can you add the departments that we are using it in? Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. So we, we are using in, in general medicine and uh, endocrinology deals with diabetes and, uh, and other departments in KGMC. But overall, more than like a 250 places, we, we, are, uh, we are hosting this technology uh, in Mumbai, places like Hiranandani, and in, in Chennai, there are uh, there are many cancer centers across the across India, 
which are using this technology. Initially, we thought that the, uh, this technology will be used uh, as a, uh, as you via chaos uh, in the regular uh, outpatient waiting area where patient would come and and go through that screening and triage and 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 the information is given to the doctor and it will save their time. Uh, but what happened this pandemic when this happened uh, last um, a couple of months ago uh, we we were quickly uh, adopted to the to the new paradigm and and new dynamics that are that are going on so what we thought it would be better if the patient themselves can can do the self uh, screening of um, of their symptoms before going to the doctor and we provided that technology on their phone. So, so what is happening now is, is that uh, most of my uh, cancer patients across India who really require like immediate uh, intervention from their, from their physicians and from their, from their doctors, they are going through this. They are uh, screening themselves uh, almost on a, uh, many times a week and sending their information to their doctors and, and not actually, and virtually meeting them um, over, over, the, uh, over the video call or something like that. Um, so that, that's the technology being used and we are glad to inform that about like 8 million patients so far have been, uh, been subjected to this technology. Yeah, yeah. That's a huge number. Uh, are you uh, working in other countries also apart from India? I'll ask about USA just now, but... Uh, uh, yeah, we are working in USA. Uh, there's a Montefiore uh, Cancer Hospital in New York mm -hmm. who we are working with. And, and there are like around like 25 cancer centers across US who are using our technology and some trials going on in Stanford as well. Uh, then we are working in UK also. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the uh, uh, large uh, diabetes and hypertension clinics uh, are using this technology uh, to remotely screen their patients and not having them to come to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And not just depending upon that, on the video technology, to connect all the time, all the time, and and interact for many minutes with the patient. Uh, this helps them to get the offline information, prepare themselves, and the conversations are very short uh, because the preparation is all all done beforehand. Okay, uh, we have a question from Babu Rao, uh, who says that many of such machine learning algorithms require a lot, a huge amount of data before they can be used to give useful results. For example, neural network, it requires a large amount of data to develop the network. How will it be tackled in a situation such as now under in COVID-19, where we can't be sure whether there is accurate data available or not? So I'll, I'll take that question. Uh, indeed, yes. that's right. What Babu Rao is saying is, is good if the um, if the huge amount of data is there, we will be able to analyze the data and figure it out. Uh, the newer uh, issues and newer newer things discovering from the uh, uh, from the data itself. So there are two parts of it, uh, and I'll I'll give by the example. In case of uh, coronavirus uh, SARS-2, uh, what is happening? We have uh, we have pretty much a lot of information out there about the uh, about what's going on with the uh, with the patient. So, what are the symptoms which will lead to the to the uh, diagnosis of uh, COVID nineteen disease? So, uh, so those were directly fed into the algorithm. We figured it out. Okay, that's going on. Uh, but the more risk studies were done on the patients who went through uh, software, figured it out, and compared with the with the multiple data uh, data sets uh, and all, uh, I'll tell you some of the newer findings that are out there for uh, for COVID nineteen disease. It was not initially in the in the algorithm to diagnose. It was like having chills and rigors. So chills and rigors were not part of the um, 
part of the associated symptoms uh, with coronavirus but that got added after all the information that has come through uh, from the computers and the algorithms that okay this is one of the key symptoms which lead actually lead to the death uh, later on uh, and all that information was coming uh, coming into the system so that's the coronavirus current thing but if you look at the other studies that were done uh, with the data sets uh, what we did um, in one of the study uh, i was uh, remotely uh, involved in that uh, the fundus of the or retina of the eye uh, was examined uh, for about like uh, 60000 patients and uh, and we were diagnosis uh, we were finding out the all the retinal diseases and all those things but the correlation that computer found uh, that uh, there is a certain set of uh, imagery in uh, in the retina image which which associated it uh, to heart disease and so a retina image can actually um, in future that that would come out even more stronger way uh, to diagnose uh, that okay how uh, um, to diagnose the patient of heart disease just by looking at the retina of the of the patient so those are the those are the uh, newer things that that are always available from uh, from the technology okay uh, shri shanta wants to ask a question uh, i can see the virtual hand raised so shri shanta please ask your question uh, thank you ma'am so uh, just a hypo- hypothetical scenario um, the app might diagnose the patient with a particular disease but when he actually goes to the doctor the doctor might think it's something else so don't you think it's actually undermining the competence of a doctor and a physician might view it as an unnecessary second opinion it's it's actually uh, i would i would look at it in a different way and and i'm i'm sure i would like uh, dr rishi to come comment on on this as well the software when it screens the patient it's not like providing any treatment or any diagnosis it gives all the relevant decision making data set which are important for a doctor to make a decision it's not replacing the doctor the software is not saying hey you have a uh, stmi heart attack or just okay just take this pill or and, and you will be fine or go to a rush to the doctor or something like that but it gives enough data points for the doctor to make an intelligent guess what is actually going on uh, with the patient so their uh, their decision making and their interaction and their time is actually saved with that uh, if we if we undermine the effort of a doctor uh, that is not the uh, that i don't think is the is the out is the objective of the of the screening of the patient the screening of the patient is to find out and and give enough enough information to the doctor dr rishi i mean what yeah. would you like I mean, to add to that i mean the same kind of fear um, has been with every technology adoption um, whenever it has come i mean uh, the real threat of artificial intelligence people say that you know it's going to replace humans and things like that so that that kind of that kind of perception and and threat perception is always there but over the years we have realized that it is it is really overrated and just to add what amit was saying that uh, we we actually have been using this kind of system uh not technology based but human based for for years you have physician nurses outside a hospital outside a doctor's chambers that do the basic homework you have your residents working the same kind of taking the ba- basic basic flow charts and basic uh, vitals of the patient you have referring physicians who you know uh, do the same kind of thing and uh, ultimately it's the responsibility and the judiciousness of the final treating physician whether to accept that or or not accept that and and his position is neither challenged by it uh, nor is compromised by it in any way i think at the same point of time uh, since he already has that kind of data set in front of his eyes if if he he just he just can cross check on a superficial level and then apply his mind and his time better to make a decision um, an informed decision for the patient so i think um, having 
uh, being using it for quite some time now, I think it's it's only help and not a threat to the physicians. Yes, yes. Uh, we have a question from Isha Gar. Uh, although I think Amit had mentioned it in one of his slides, that what has been the response of patients regarding the use of such technologies in different countries uh, where it is being used? So maybe Rishi, you can give your... Uh, yeah, I mean, I can take that first. I mean, who wouldn't, I mean, if I have to ask a patient, if I ask a patient to come to my outpatient at 8 a.m. in the morning on a mid-working week um, and wait till like 3 p.m. to just get two minutes of my time for a problem which may be as small as tweaking his um, antihypertensive medication because his blood pressure had been hovering a little bit above the baseline levels. I don't think so. It's efficient for, and it's, it's very conducive atmosphere for him to wait that long. So given the traffic times, given the distances in India, I mean, uh, who would not like to remain in touch with his doctor without physically going and spending a lot of time, money, effort. And when the patient, many a times when they come, they come uh, with, with, with the relatives. So at least, I mean, two people have to take the day off and things. So I think it's really a win-win situation more so for the uh, patients than for the doctors. So I think, um, you know, uh, patients take to it like fresh water. Yes, yes. Amit, you would like to add something? Yeah, I mean, one of the part of that question was about the other con different countries. Mm. Uh, see, uh, I'll give you a very short example of uh, UK. In UK, a doctor is asked to spend minimum five minutes with the patient in order to get picked. So they cannot see more than 12 patients in an, uh, in an hour. Uh, so what happens and, and they get, so if they see more patients, they, they don't get money. If they see less patients, they don't get money. Uh, mm. And so what happens and what was happening uh, with most of the doctors were, they were spending much more time than, than five minutes with the patient. So their efficiency was was going down, and they and lot of things which a software can does and in, I mean if the software has got the intelligence and all those things, so uh, they said that okay because of uh, um, because of the uh, because of the reports from the software and all those things they were able to spend uh, about five minutes with the with most of the patients and and still in the compliance with the NHS and the national guidelines. Uh, that was one of the reasons why, why people in, uh, in UK preferred, because the documentation is, there are very strict guidelines for the documentation in UK uh, and all the patients uh, have to, uh, information has to be filled for all the patients and all. And, and it is definitely not possible for a doctor to complete all those things in five minute time that is, that is given by the, by, their national health system. So, so those are the those are the important aspects from uh, from doctors' point of view. Okay, uh, perhaps a behavioral science question uh, from Rahul Sharma, who says that patients value doctor-patient interaction a lot. If, if if they they are able to talk to the doctor and they and of course very often they want to talk more to the doctor than what is required. And as Rishi says, when you are dealing with 500 to 600 patients in the OPD every day, how is that possible? So how is the faith of patients in artificial intelligence and machine learning based solutions? How, how do we reinforce that faith? So um, if you talk about remote monitoring when they are at home, mm -hmm. at least they are, they are still in connect with the doctor. I mean, they're not meeting him physically, but they are in connect with the doctor directly. Mm -hmm. So that part is, of course, um, uh, answered there. When they come to the outpatient, then they are first exposed to um, something like a robotic triage, a kiosk. They again do come to their physicians. And while if they get like, let's say, a five minutes with their, with their doctor, and if he already has all the relevant data points, that he would waste less time in doing that and more time in giving uh, productive advice to them and talking to them in terms of allaying their fears and their anxieties. 
And if you get five minutes and the doctor spends four minutes in taking your blood pressure and pulse and doing your basic history and basic examination, then you get less of that quality time uh, of when he has the position to talk to you in an in a empathetic way. So I think that um, when we use such system, it only uh, eases the doctor's mind and his, allows him to give more time, more empathetic time to his patients. And that leads to an overall more patient satisfaction than less. Uh, uh, I personally feel, Rishi and um, Amit, both, both of you, that I think uh, this technology is not, it's relevant to all hospitals, but I think it's more required in government hospitals. When we just, if I come and see the OPD crowd in Rishi's um, uh, uh, clinic or anywhere else in any of the department, I think that this is the best solution. So uh, are they promoting or are the government hospitals uh, interested in have, uh, having these solutions? Yes, I, I had the interaction with the uh, with many uh, government hospital own, I mean, uh, decision makers, mm -hmm. and and I met with the folks in Niti Aayog also, uh, who are forming uh, the guidelines for these things. One of the doctors is Dr. Um, VK Paul uh, out there, who is defining that, and then Ayushman Bharat CEO, Dr. So, so we met. We met these people. We discussed the ideas, and they are they are in unison. I mean, they know that okay, these type of things are definitely going to help the patients, and and we are trying to do that uh, at the same time. So, uh, uh, so it is just a matter of time. Uh, the one of the one of the quotations I I remember from from Prime Minister Modi that uh, if if a if a mobile or a or a car has to change the lane or change the change the course, it takes like a two minute, two seconds, just like take a turn. But if it a very long good strain has to make a ninety degree change, it will take a long time. It will take a long curve to uh, to do that to do, do that change. So so that's the similar uh, similarly go government hospitals will adopt. And they are adopting, uh, but it's it it takes time to to do that. We have a question from Ajay, uh, who says that we had heard from Barrister Shamim Patwari, a member of Parliament from Bangladesh, speaking on this forum two days ago, and he outlined the need uh, for such a platform as you have been talking today for developing countries like India and Bangladesh. So, what are your plans to? Uh, go out of India, US, and UK, uh, maybe to other uh, low and middle income Asian countries. Are there any plans? We have to get to that. Uh, mm -hmm. There is no doubt about it. Uh, mm -hmm. It is just that, like, uh, the limited bandwidth that that a newer companies generally have to to expand quickly to to these. Uh, uh, other economies, uh, but I'm sure um, we would like to we would like to address the information, I, address address this issue at the uh, at the other uh, countries as well. Uh, uh, Rishi, I think uh, you know uh, Mr. Patwari. Yes, very well. We, yes. He, he so, visited so, us some time back. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So maybe you can uh, carry it to Bangladesh because he had just expressed this need. Uh, two days ago in this at this forum only. I would I would surely apply a friendly arm twist to Amit to yes. go to Bangladesh at least in for for our friendship. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Then uh, we have a question from Rahul Sharma who says that uh, we have heard from the Supreme Court lawyer Mr. Anand Grover again in this SDG talk series uh, last week about patents and intellectual property rights barriers. Are there any such concerns with these solutions? That is the first question, and then he has another question. So, Amit, uh, I think you have to address so, that. Uh, see, these ba barriers are are there. Uh, the newer tech mm -hmm. people who are inventing the technology, who are who are building newer stuff, uh, and and they spend a huge amount of money to uh, 
to come up with the with the solution and and a lot of effort has gone into the into the system and they generally try to protect it with the uh, uh, with whatever uh, legal means that are available in terms of like a patents copyrights things like that and and that's very normal for uh, uh, for any any company to have that uh, so this uh, so I mean, using this technology, yes. I mean, people can use the technology if they want, uh, as such. Uh, but yes, those there are limitations to using that uh, if there are patents associated with that. Okay. Uh, his next question is: uh, What is the experience of working with healthcare providers using state-of-art technology? Are that do you have you faced any barriers there? Anything we can do better for more preparedness amongst the healthcare workers to accept new ways of doing things. The change is always resisted. I mean, across whoever, uh, uh, whatever we do. I mean, if I get out of my of my home and and goes from the left side to into the car, um, and then when I go to India and I have to get from the right hand side into my car there is a change and i feel uncomfortable with that and that comfort uh, slowly uh, over some are very small changes to make and within a day or two you can get accustomed there are others who, which will take a little bit longer time and that also depends on many on people to people when they, in the healthcare uh, health workers uh, there are people who are extremely um, open to uh, to the technology and to the newer ways of doing things and, and they adopt technologies very, very fast. Uh, but there are people who would resist, like uh, uh, you may still find people who don't want to change their rotatory phone uh, even today. They would like, they love their sound of having that phone, so. Okay, uh, Rishi, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, I, I would completely second that and uh, I mean, uh, we um, both me and Amit have been, you know, sort of a victims of the same problem in mean, how to, I think, I think the most difficult part here is the healthcare workers to change their basic practice pattern because we get so comfortable with what we have been doing over a period of time that um, again, some people will adopt that change very quickly, but um, you know, to a majority of people who have been working in a certain kind of way, um, to make the paradigm shift is a little challenging, but slowly when you are persistent and when you show the data and when they see the technology working for the patients, uh, I think uh, they get to turn around that, that barrier. Okay. Uh, now my one last request to the participants, if you want to ask a question, please be ready with it because then we are about to close. I will just ask one question which is already there. And uh, so this is your last chance to type in a question or raise your virtual hand. Uh, this is a comment as well as a question from Jitimani Thong Pradhar from Chiang Mai, uh, Thailand. Uh, she says, I'm very glad I joined this session as uh, uh, Professor Rishi Sethi quoted Martin Luther King. It is important to see hope and light at the end of the tunnel. I'm from Chiang Mai University Medical College Oncology Department. My question is more of concern over years. Technology is developed with so much effort, but regulatory and a range of other challenges related to access and delivery take many more years and sometimes never happen. How do we roll out technology that can bring in change with urgency and immediacy that this pandemic warrants? I think I'll take that. Uh, it's a very, very pertinent question because um, what we have been seeing over, um, I have also had the fortune of being, uh, you know, part of the innovation network of the university, um, both within the Institute as well as with other leading IITs and other places. And whenever we implement a new technology, new device, uh, or maybe a new drug, the incubation period of that technology from being conceptualized to reaching the patient can run anywhere of a minimum of three to five years 
to a median of 10 years and maybe 15 years or so. By the time maybe the world has changed, maybe the patterns have changed and the amount of effort that has gone by, maybe sometimes you don't get regulatory approvals at the end of the day. So it's a lot of hard work and it involves a huge amount of human effort and money and, and time. But having said that, I think uh, with every mountain of despair, there's a ray of hope. So what this pandemic is telling mm -hmm. us that the world is going to be a different place as we move on. Uh, you see, um, we, we, were, we were publishing articles on um, and it, the general response time of various scientific publication houses was was three months, six months to respond. Now they are responding on a daily basis and uh, things are working faster than we think. In terms of vaccine development, you had generally an older vaccine. It took five years, 10 years to develop a vaccine for Ebola. It took around two years, three years to develop a vaccine. And now we are talking about the vaccine maybe on the block in the next one year or so. That involves the manufacturing, the clinical trials, the regulatory approvals and so on and so forth. FDA is making uh, uh, frequent meetings now. So every process is being a little bit um, streamlined and people are realizing the importance that when we have to, when put in a very difficult situation, the regulatory authorities, the government, the, the clinical trialist, everybody seems to realize now that uh, time is really not on our side when we are fighting the disease. So if we keep on delaying these processes, the humanity will keep on suffering. So I think things are changing and post COVID, uh, which, which has led to a great amount of realization on various fronts, we will find a situation where the incubation time uh, between the conceptualization to the delivery of newer technologies will be reduced um, to a much, much uh, shorter duration than we had probably experienced. So I think there is a ray of, and, and I'm very hopeful on that front. Okay. Uh, and Jitimani has a request uh, for Evolco to come to Thailand. Amit, this is for you. And also, will it be possible to have such sessions with interpretations in different languages like Thai, Nepalese and other languages, again, probably of the South Asian and Southeast Asian regions. A uh, lot many people will be able to benefit uh, from Professor Rishi and our technology expert. So, uh, what do you have to say to that? Amit, you are on mute. Amit, Amit you are on mute. Amit, Amit, you are on mute. You are on mute. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. oh, how yes. come yes. it that? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Hello? Hello, yeah. yes. You can hear you now. We can hear you now. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, I'll be glad to uh, come to Thailand. Uh, please share my, uh, my email uh, with her. Uh, as far as the different languages are concerned, we, we realize that the best response from a patient uh, can, be, can be gathered in their native language. Mm -hmm. And so we built in the support for native language. It supports 12 Indian languages. Uh, so there are, I mean, for every uh, other, Indi mostly, I mean, it covers a vast majority of, of India. Uh, not all the languages, but, but 12, but uh, we know that okay, we can we can incorporate any other language as well. Uh, so that support is there in the software. It's just a matter of exposing it to to other languages, uh, which we would do that. Okay, uh, we now come to the end of today's session, and we will be meeting again on Monday, May fourth, at three p.m. to listen to Dr. Ishwar Gilada, who would share India's journey to end AIDS since the first case got diagnosed in the country in 1986. Bye till then and stay safe. And our sincere thanks once again to Amit Khare and Dr. Rishi Sethi. Thank you. Thank you so much.